Um, I'm going to start with you, Bob, because a lot of people may not know, you know who you are or what you do. Could you tell us a bit about your background? Sure. I spent 43 years working for one company, which is very unusual these days. I started with Douglas Aircraft Company as a summer job. And as my career was evolving in 1968, I was asked by my boss if I had any ideas about what he could tell the Air Force about how we get to orbit 10 years from now. And so for a joke, I said, well, why don't you tell them how the alleged UFOs do it? He said, it's a great idea. Why don't you work on that? So that was when I read my first UFO book. It was by Don Menzel. And I looked at it, and I, and I, I concluded that this guy is ignoring all the data. And then I, I read another 50 books. <laughs> and a year later, I was standing in for my boss to report on how well we were doing on contracts. So it's uh, our job was to get new contracts. And I said, well, we're, we're, we're doing fine. I gave him the regular report. And then afterwards, they said, well, Dr. Wood, we don't hear from you very often. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do that's interesting? And so in a moment, I decided to say, well, you know, you're not going to believe this. But in fact, I've read 50 UFO books. And the only thing that's unclear to me, since it's clear to me that they are clear, manned by extraterrestrials, the only thing that's unclear is to whether or not we figure out how they work before or after Lockheed. Lockheed was our competitor at the time. And there was a long moment of silence. And uh, my immediate boss, who was the vice president, uh, my boss's boss, said, what would he think it would take to look into that? And so the net result of that conversation is over the next year and a half, we spent a half million dollars of company money looking, trying to look into how UFOs worked. We hired a detective to interview alleged witnesses. We hired a physicists to create new theories. We set up a little laboratory to spin magnets. And we bought a van to go to the top of mountains and record whatever we could see. And after a year and a half, we knew one thing, and that was how fast we were spending the money. We had no idea how close we were getting to the answer. So we canceled the project. And at that time, I got reassigned to come to live in, in Newport Beach, actually, and work on the Ballistic Missile Defense Program. So for the next Eight years, I, did, I became a BMD radar guy. And then for the years after that, I worked on improving our independent research and development scores, which was very helpful dollar-wise. And I wound up working on the International Space Station at the end of my career. So I had a fun career working on missiles and winding up in space. Was in, involved at a high level of management for most of the time I was a director. I never was willing to put in the 70 hours a week required to make it the VP. But when I retired in 1993, I was very happy. And then one of the guys that I had hired for this project was Stan Friedman, because he had a reputation of, of knowing about the literature. Was this the, the UFO project that yeah, put you on? They project. paid you to hunt UFOs. Yeah, yeah, right. So. When I retired in 1993, about a year later, I got a call from my former employee, Stan Friedman. I said, you know, I've, saw, I've got a document that's a fax of, of something that looks kind of interesting. It says, uh, technology, recovery, in, recovery and disposal. He says, a fax. Would you be interested in trying to authenticate it? And I said, sure. So. I did that, and that's when I became involved in authenticating questioned leaked UFO documents that were classified. And this particular document turned out to be a winner because we went to, I went to personally to the government printing office and showed it to a guy who was involved at that time, 1954 was the time of the document. And he looked at it and he said, well, you know, based on the content, I'd say this is a hoax because it was, the title was Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. They were telling about how we get started on this program, uh, how you keep the public in the dark, how you lie to them to make sure they don't report UFOs. So anyway, it, it turned out to be uh, authentic. The guy looked at it and he said, well, based on the content, I would say it's, it's folk, a phony. But based on the fact that there's a raised Z and the type font is exactly the type font that was used in 1954, which I was responsible for, he said. I would say it clearly was printed by a government printing office in 1954. No question about it. So that established my credibility in the UFO community. And 
people started sending me more question documents to authenticate many of which were top secret. So you, you wound up in this position where you're now the guy yeah, I'm the to guy. talk to about yeah. authenticating these yeah. documents. And right. by the way, on that particular document, I remember finding that online and reading it, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? Yeah. You know, and, and I had some interest in, in the UFOs, and I found it fascinating. And could it be true? Now, here I am sitting with a man who authenticated this thing. Let me ask you, before you came across those, those documents, before you read your first book, you're in college, did, did you have any interest or knowing of UFOs? And I think I read one book by Gerald Hurd called Is Another Word World Watching? And uh, his theory was that they must be insects because the accelerations would, uh, would be sustain sustainable only by insects that had their structural shell on the outside. And that's, as I recall, the only book I ever read until I read this first one. By but it's playing, it's playing our realm of and knowledge of uh, three-dimensional aerodynamics and you know, not, nothing about inertial. Yeah, my, my, my degree was in aeronautical engineering and then I had a PhD in physics at Cornell. So I, uh, that's why I got the job of being a, a radar expert because they didn't have anybody who was a radar expert and they figured anybody with a PhD in physics ought to be able to learn it. So. That was how I got involved in radar. I mean, even when you're out chasing these things, I mean, you said a camera, you're on the mountaintops with this van or what mm -hmm. have you. Did you ever catch sight of anything while you were out there? Did you see anything? No, we sent this van. I didn't go personally, but we sent this van uh, to the top of a mountain where allegedly there had been many UFOs reported. Mm -hmm. And he was there for a week, and, and he took photographs of anything interesting, but there was nothing, nothing right. to see. So it didn't really kind of no. nothing you could put your finger That was a good example of why we canceled the project, you know, we spent all this money to instrument this van and got nothing. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So that then, then after, after I established kind of a mini reputation in the UFO field, I got a call from a guy by the name of Joe Firmich. He says, I'm a dot-com executive. He said, I understand you've got question documents about UFOs. And I said, yes. He said, well, he said, I'd like to, I'd like to borrow them and authenticate them. And so I said, well, and then he said, what do you think they're worth? I said, I don't know, they might be worth millions. So after that, then I called up Hal Putoff, who was my friend, mm -hmm. and said, this guy claims that he knows you. And he said, oh yeah, Joe Firmage, he's a good guy. <laughs> and so I called Joe back and said, yeah, okay. Uh, he said, well, I, I got a yacht in Newport Beach and you live there. How about coming down this Sunday and showing me the documents? So I said, okay, so I found his boat showed him all the documents. And my first wife had been pretty skeptical about my wasting my time on UFOs after I retired. So I had uh, a little skeptical attitude when I, I visited with Joe. But Joe looked at him, he said, these are exactly what I want. And he said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to offer you the opportunity, if, if I authenticate these, then I will print 2,000 copies of the documents, and you can have those and sell them. And so I said, well, Joe, is, is that all? Did you have any other cash involved? Oh, he said, I forgot. And he opened his briefcase and he took out a check already made out to me for $500,000. Wow. So, you know, the UFOs are clearly a complete waste of time for you. That's right. And you shouldn't That's focus right. any more time on that. That's right. So I came home from that meeting and my wife said, well, how'd the meeting go with Joe? And I said, well, pretty good. <laughs> she looked at the check and said, how do you know it's any good? So, <laughs> Of course. Well, that's what women do. You know, they, they, they look at men sideways. That's their role in life. What, right. So anyway, we, I, it turned out the, it was on, written on the same bank I banked with. So I went to my bank in, the next morning and, and they said, can you tell me about the, this account? And, and two minutes later, they said, the money's all in the account. So I called up Joe and said, Joe, we'd like to accept your deal. This was actually a joint with my son, who was oh, involved okay. a little bit. Now, was, this, was it just the one document we talked about a moment ago, with the crash recovery? No, no, no. It was, it was a whole pile of documents. It was, it was that plus a number of others, okay. probably 30 or so documents. So anyway, we, the, the check was good. We cashed it. And, and Joe uh, did exactly what he promised to do. He, he had his company print 2,000 copies of these documents. And we were getting such interest that he said he wanted to make a video of the truth. He said, you know, I'll give you $300,000 to do that. Actually, it was 250. So my son and I went to Hollywood and found out there were five different ways to get screwed in Hollywood. We found them all. 
<laughs> I'm sure there's more than five. I, yeah, there's more than five. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we did create this uh, video uh, called The Truth, mm -hmm. evidence that we are not alone. Mm -hmm. And everybody was happy with that. And then that's Kent and Joe went on to other things. And, and by then, my son and I were clearly involved in the process of, of, uh, of studying the subject. Um, I want to, um, if you wouldn't mind, could you tell us a little bit about uh, MJ-12 and those documents and how you, you came into that whole scenario? Because I know the website out there that you and your son have have just a, a ton of information out there. Well, yeah, the website is majesticdocuments.com, and that's where my son actually set up that website. And in that website, we put in a high-quality scanned copy of every document that we have. Actually, most of whom, all of which are in the other room, you know, just a few feet away from where we are. Each document has a, a story to tell of its own, and then there's an authentication issue associated with each one, varying from really rock solid occasionally, where it's, it's a copy of something that was supposed to go to the MJ-12 or the CIA, and, uh, to documents that seem to be the right kind of words at the right time written by the right guy, but, but you can't prove that there actually were, in fact, top secret documents. So I get, I get the impression that maybe there's, um, I haven't really dug too deep in, in all honesty. I'm not super familiar with MJ-12, a little inkling about well, that. So for our viewers who don't know. Um, well, I think a good example of an MJ-12 document would be one that uh, was, was written during the very early part of, of the war, actually just before the war, because at the so-called Battle of LA, which is like February 25th, 1942, after we shot down 1,430, well, after we used 1,430 rounds of ammunition to try to shoot down one or more craft, then there was some information that Bill Tompkins got, but also there were some documents that were written by one by Marshall, who was the head of the Army, and, and to FDR, and one from FDR back that, that basically said, one of the documents said that we had recovered two craft. One was shot down in the, in the San Bernardino Mountains, and the other was salvaged by the, the Navy at sea. So thank you for that, because I know I've, I've talked to Bill a bit, and, and we've discussed this in our conversations, but other than what Bill has said, I was unaware that there was actual documentation that that, that indicates that actually happened. That's the early, earliest top secret documents that, that I've seen. And, and then it begins a string of, of, of classified documents uh, throughout. W one of the things that Bill told me recently that surprised me a little bit is that the documents that he was dealing with, even though they were clearly super top secret, were not stamped at all. And the, the Navy seemed to feel that that was better protection if you just control physically Bill, Bill, was it was it an issue of, of better protection, or was it just they hadn't maybe advanced their compartmentalization of security to that point? Actually, like Bob says, it was uh, so classified, the best thing to do was not classify it at all and uh, uh, keep it in your own uh, facilities. And uh, uh, the admiral that was handling that, Admiral Riccobata, uh, four star, that, that was his approach. He just said, we're not going to put any document out of this facility that's even confidential. So uh, every trip that we made, uh, we didn't handle any security documents. <laughs> Unbelievable. So all, this, all these documents you're digging up that you're now authenticating, be the MG-12 or other governmental documents that are kind of pointing uh, some kind of evidence, be it circumstantial or otherwise, it's, they're not marked. They don't really kind of give the blessing that this thing ever existed within uh, a security structure. Well, the documents I'm talking about, MJ-12 documents, right. were all marked. Oh, they, oh, those were marked? Oh, yeah, those were marked top secret. And I, in some cases, only secret. But, but mostly, the, the ones that are really important were the ones that were marked top secret. The people who challenge the skeptics sometimes who challenge the authenticity. Yeah, let's talk about them. I mean, what kinds of things are they saying? Well, one thing they say is that, is that the first place, they don't follow the procedures for classifying documents. And then they go into detailing, this is what the procedure says, and this document doesn't follow that procedure. And so they're 
unwilling to accept that the security person in charge of a program can do whatever he cares, no matter what the official rules say. And th that idea has just never seeped through into their minds. So th that's the first char challenge, is, is they don't follow the procedures. And then, of course, the skeptics go on to say, well, how would you ever keep this secret? You know, and that's still an extremely valid question. I, I mean, as I've talked more and more to Bill and learned more about, about what really went on that we didn't learn about, I mean, basically, if you can convince somebody that the Germans got to the far side of the moon before the war ended, then you can convince them of anything. But <laughs> it's very hard to make that first step. <laughs> but that's where it is. I think you really have to, we really need to establish the fact that there's a process in place that, that actually controls what the public can learn in multiple levels of great sophistication, and that's been going on since the Manhattan Project. It started with compartmentalization. Yeah. So, so for you, it's a chase, really. I mean, I can see the passion you have with this. I mean, you've got to, to be doing it for this long. I mean, there's, there's a passion there, clearly. For you, based on all the research you've done, is MJ-12 real? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They, they don't know everything that's going on, though. They, the MJ-12 people, who were mostly associated with the Air Force, thought that they were a separate entity and were really in charge of everything. But what they didn't know is that, in my judgment, the Navy took the ship that they got in 1942, and they started to reverse engineer it right away. They didn't wait for anybody but Forrestal to tell them to go ahead and do it. And so I don't know where they did it, but... China Lake would have been a good place to start. So my guess is that craft got shipped to the Navy and the Navy people did the best they could to try to figure out how they worked. Mm -hmm. I think it still took the Navy you know, a decade or so to, to get enough smarts to, to figure it out. Yeah. But I think the Navy um, was the first to, to get the essential ingredients of, of trying to, to replicate them. The interesting, ironic thing is when I was first offered the opportunity in 1968 to figure out how they work by my management, the thing that, that makes me really think <laughs> twice now is that it had already been done when I'm in 1968. I'm sure that the Navy knew how they worked by then, and probably the Air Force too. Interesting, but Douglas didn't. No. No. As close as Douglas was to the Navy, you'd think, you know, hey. <laughs> well, the, the, the first crash actually was a crash at Cape Girardeau when there was a minister who was asked to come up to bless some bodies. And uh, that crash, the Army got parts and uh, the FBI got parts. And, and then, of course, in the Battle of L.A., the Army got more parts and the Navy got parts. The CIA, in the meantime, was lurking in the corners trying to get their hands on whatever they could, the counterintelligence people, the CIA, Angleton in particular. Um, so that these multiple agencies all trying to keep control of the recovered parts, mm -hmm. not knowing that their colleagues <laughs> had, had other parts. <laughs> well, I mean, but Bill, your book kind of touches on a little bit of that, that tug of war with, with parts and pieces. Yes. So it's, it's, it's just interesting to hear you, you know, talk about this and we get to read about it in Bill's book as well. So, yeah, my re the remarks that I'm making right now are different from the ones I would have made 10 years ago before I met Bill. Uh, yeah, well, see, let's talk about that. So let's go there. Let's talk about, yeah, here's a man, you know, PhD, Cornell, uh, aeronautics engineer degree from Colorado, rock, basically a rocket scientist, right? Cooling systems, I believe, in the rockets is what you said. 43 years at, at McDonnell Douglas, a stellar career. And you've got this gentleman who, who was pulled out of the ninth grade, thrown into the service. <laughs> and how, you know, and now here he is pitching this program that fixes everything for Debus and Von Braun, and it becomes, you know, our Apollo program. How did you two get together? How did this, how does a guy like you connect with a guy like this to, and then cross over? Tell us, tell us a little bit about that story about no. the thought process you had to go to to kind of quote unquote come on board with the, the reality of the ETs. 
Well, let Bob say how we got together because it's really uh, one of his friends in the business that got me to go with Bob. Well, my recollection of first talking to Bill was on the phone when I got a phone call from him. Oh, yes. yes. and, and he started telling me a little bit about his story. And so I, I wrote down a page's worth of notes. I said, well, this is kind of unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being honest. <laughs> But I had had one of the things, one of the jobs I was given back at, at the Douglas Aircraft was to interview people who, from the outside world who had ideas. And I found that no matter how wild or weird they sounded, it was always good to listen to them because once, one time out of 10, their idea would be based on, on some facts. So I had trained myself to never turn anybody off just, just because they had a wild idea. So I listened to everything that Bill had to say, took notes, and concluded he had some interesting things. And, and I think I concluded, we concluded, that we had to meet face to face. Right. And yeah. so, I mean, so you had this practice, having worked at Douglas and, and have done this before, so you're just practicing the same thing over the phone with, right. with Bill. What was this, a few years ago? When did you all meet? 2009. 2009. It looked, took a long time. He said, well, I've been writing a book. and." It, it turned out he had been writing a book with, I think, at least three other kinds of editors who were unable to extract words that could be printed. And, and so I uh, looked at what had been written so far and concluded that it needed a lot of work. And in terms of sequencing things, in terms of sometimes the grammar and stuff like that. Sure. But uh, his story fundamentally intrigued me. and. And I think it was probably only after the first year or so I felt when well, this guy's, you know, he's real, he's telling the truth, he's telling everything as best as he can remember it. And I wish I could remember as much as he can remember, you know, that many years ago. But I, I, I never doubted for, for a moment, well, after we became acquainted, that, that what he was telling me was as best as he could remember what really happened. He didn't evaluate or embellish on anything. If he didn't know the answer, he said he didn't know. And so that made me feel comfortable that. Not, not quite, because for the first six months, he didn't believe one word I was telling <laughs> Chime in any time, Bill. Let's hear it. Yeah. So anyway, we started shaping the book up. And uh, it, it took a long time until I got seriously interested in actually making this a real book. And I forget exactly what it was that triggered me, but in the last two years was it? 2014, I guess it was, yeah. we really started to look at drafts. And, and then, because I had published a book called Alien Viruses using uh, Richard Dolan and CreateSpace, uh, which is Amazon's subsidiary, I was encouraged to think about how easy that would be just to publish it myself. So rather than trying to find somebody to do the publishing, I just learned enough about how to do it online myself. And I concluded all you needed to have was some JPEGs and some, a, a Word document that was, had, was correct. Push the button and, and off it goes. <laughs> that it, they'll, yeah, they'll tell you what's wrong. Yeah. What's wrong. Yeah. Tell me about how you first learned about Bill at Douglas Aircraft. Well, after Bill told me the story, of course, the first thing that was obvious was that he worked at the same place I worked at. And he worked in the same building I worked at and knew the same people I knew. And so it was, and he had copies of the memos on our same format. So I thought, well, you know, the one thing that I can absolutely attest is that his story of, of being at, at Douglas Aircraft is, is valid. And all the people who were on the copies of the memos were, were men I knew. Now, because I was a, an engineer who dealt with thermodynamics and radar later. Uh, typically, and Bill knows better than anybody, uh, the, the, the engineers typically look down on the draftsman. The engineers you know, basically create, this, the, create the design, and the draftsman merely just put their pencils on the paper and do this trivial yeah. stuff. So that's the way engineers thought about draftsmen. <laughs> so, so even had I wanted to. Uh, to find out more about what Bill, Bill was doing, he was working in, in ground support electronics, which I had nothing to do with. 
And furthermore, he was a draftsman. And I wouldn't have been inclined to go talk to a draftsman, an ordinary draftsman, just putting pencils on, on the paper. So, so there was that schism, schism between you know, the people who thought they knew a lot, the people who allegedly were actually doing the real work. And, uh, and it, it took me a good deal of experience in the company to realize that everybody was doing a very important job in order to make it all work. So when, when I learned that Bill had been there at the same time I'd been there, I started to ask myself the question of how come we never met? And I just concluded that uh, it was just because I was working on something different from what he was working on. I mean, I, I was very familiar with uh, our S4B program, which was a third stage for the Apollo program. And, uh, but I was not assigned to do anything there. And I knew all the folks that he was working with, but I, I didn't know him. So I'm going to go back to UFO for a sec. Um, you were chasing UFOs. We've established that and never got to see one. Um, you're also involved with, uh, with MUFON down here as well, right? Yes. What's, yes. Your, what's your capacity at MUFON? Well, I just finished... I think 17 years as one of, her, one of their board members, and uh, I retired from that position. And are you still active? I'm still active, yes. Actually, I'm still involved in helping to plan next year's conference, which it hasn't been publicly announced yet, is going to be. Do we want to broadcast that now? Because this is going to go out. <laughs> I don't think so. I want to ask you, and I asked you this the last time we visited, and I love this topic, because you've, you've been involved with MUFON. Yes. Um, and you've met people who have seen UFOs and who have had encounters with ET. Would you ever want to see a UFO? No. This, Why not? Well, well I'd see one. I might be willing to see one if it's 100 feet away. But my observation is that the the Subsequent events that happen to people who get really closely involved is generally not good. Uh, there's probably exceptions, but uh, I haven't ever personally seen one. I've never personally been threatened, and I'm, quote, saying too much to the public. I've spoken with the Rotary Club, the exchange club I belong to, telling them what's really going on, and nobody seems to care. So, <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. You know, people are pretty busy with their lives, and uh, yeah. it doesn't, it's not anything that kind of affects them. Right. But I, I think with respect to actually becoming involved with uh, interacting with an alien, uh, I don't think that would necessarily be, be good for my life. I'm, I'm happy with my current wife and my current situation. Being involved in this as an as editor, uh, communicating what I think is a real word, is, is a lot of fun. So far, nobody's threatened me. And if they did, I might stop. Who knows? I... Yeah. yeah. And I just find it interesting. It's, it just seems like a, a, a little bit of a contrast. You know, you've got a guy who's helping Bill, writing the books, extraterrestrials, but just keep the UFOs and the ET away from me. <laughs> so I think that's so funny. How about you, Bill? You, uh, have you ever seen a UFO, Bill? Do I need to ask that question? Well, actually, I shot saw one on a photograph of my uncle. Uh, actually, uh, he was uh, chief surgeon at Santa Monica Hospital and uh, spent a lot of time in Egypt studying the Egyptian culture and the hieroglyphics. So he and my aunt were both on camels over there and a photographer took the picture of the two of them on the two different camels and between the pyramids in the back was a UFO. That's really the closest that I got to seeing a UFO. So not even in the backyard of your, was that your mom's house in Florida? You may be referring to my cousin, my brother and I in the backyard in a, a small house in Hollywood. And uh, my cousin digging the holes in the backyard. Uh, we were, 
I guess I was seven or eight, and brother was two years older, and my uh, cousin was about the same age. Mm -hmm. So we were all brought up together. And so we're in the backyard. We didn't have any landscaping because everybody was pretty poor. And we would dig holes. And we were digging holes in the dirt in the back. We'd actually go down and pull the dirt out and go down deeper and pull the dirt out. And uh, then these porch uh, came over. And uh, they were watching us there. And uh, so the first thing you say, well, what's abort? And uh, so these were just really nice small people that uh, would, they wouldn't just appear, but they would come, they always came from around the side of the house, like from the street level, along the side of the house, and then they'd appear in the backyard. And uh, they would be talking in some sort of language and uh, very friendly, uh, watching us dig the holes, and then they dig some holes too. And uh, uh, finally, uh, it got to a point where they were interfering with my cousin's uh, hole, and uh, so he had to sort of make them back off. And, uh, but we didn't go as enemies, and they would leave. Uh, so again, the question came out, who were the Borts? And uh, I guess Bob doesn't know much about this part, but true. Uh, my cousin, uh, John Handen, uh, uh, he got malaria in the Pacific during World War II, uh, came back, uh, got his doctors in geology, went to work for a shell oil company down in Houston, and had to leave California and uh, got married, went down there. And uh, he continued his studies and finally got a doctor's in astrophysics. And he became a very prominent uh, astronomer. And uh, uh, he was funded in a hole drill, uh, drill bowling, uh, drilling program off of the East Coast down on a platform underneath the ocean where they drilled down the deepest hole to, for research with uh, what the planet was made of underneath the ocean bottom. A lot of publicity about it. And uh, so he, and, uh, he became uh, an advisor to TRW Systems, which I worked at uh, quite a number of years after I had left uh, 12 years at Douglas, where Bob was. And uh, so he became a consultant to us. And uh, it was interesting that uh, his Borts continued to be involved in his drilling of the deepest holes on the planet. Is this the first you're hearing about this? Yes. And so uh, uh, John, uh, got funded, he, he, he became uh, Dean of Texas A&M, and uh, got considerable money to study extraterrestrials, and of course his, his interpret of the Borts were that they were uh, extraterrestrial children. Uh, that's in the backyard of a small house in Hollywood. So, you yeah. know, if, I, if I'm an ET child, where am I going to hang out? You know, there's a backyard in Hollywood. <laughs> Let's go there. Yeah. Let's go dig some holes. So, uh, John actually got involved in extraterrestrial, obviously from the boards. And he was involved in uh, studying the relationship between extraterrestrial boards or other extraterrestrials in different parts of the galaxy. And he did many studies uh, reviewing what extraterrestrials, uh, who they were, what they were involved in, uh, why they would possibly be here, were they actually here. And uh, here he is a astrophysicist. His job is studying dirt. Uh, 
structure of the planets, uh, comes up with all kinds of philosophies about different extraterrestrials from different planets in the solar system. Is this written up somewhere, Bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, very well written. Uh, uh, you, you got something to read, don't you? <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying that uh, that's just a part that uh, Bob and I hadn't gotten into much. Uh, but it was fun with uh, them bouncing around in that backyard. I mean, with parents around, adults see them? I mean, was it just you kids back there? Uh, I mean, people didn't see them. Uh, other people didn't see them. The oh, three they were there, but they didn't see them? Yeah. Yeah, that was a question. Good question, Bob. So, they, so there were adults there, but they, didn't, they couldn't see the ports. Yeah. But you could. And uh, so obviously there was some sort of a connection there. Hmm. Now, I have to go back from that to Uncle Harding's hobby, because like we said, he was chief surgeon at the Santa Monica Hospital. I uh, was making extremely good money. I had a beautiful, large home four weeks from, or four blocks from the beach in Santa Monica. And uh, when my dad was out of a job, uh, we stayed with them for two years. And he and his wife and the three daughters were taking continued trips to Egypt, uh, storming over and inside of the pyramids and making arrangements to bring back all types of Egyptian artifacts. Now, Uncle Harding was convinced that the Egyptians were related to extraterrestrials, and he was convinced that extraterrestrials existed out in the galaxy and were somehow being involved in uh, what's taking place on this planet. So his, his work was studying everything that he could find, looking at all aspects of the Egyptian civilization here on this planet, and what were all the artifacts. We brought them back. He had thousands of photographs he took over in Egypt. Brought them back, set up studies, different people on uh, all different subjects. And he sort of narrated, sometimes uh, participated as a senior member of the groups, sort of an advisor to different studies, uh, obviously heavy in astronomy. This is over at TRW? Uh, no, he did this mostly independent uh, with his work in, uh, in Texas, in Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, he was an advisor to Caltech. He was also an advisor to TRW systems and uh, became a principal in the program. What the, the boards had to do with it, uh, anybody's guess. The principal in what program are we talking about, Bill? Um, uh, primarily in uh, uh, communications uh, and in uh, interpretations of the language, interpretations of the hieroglyphics, and uh, because I have to say, I was at Douglas when uh, Bob was there for 12 years, so, but we never worked together there. But uh, we worked on many of the same programs, same missile programs, and uh, just, just doing different things. And uh, so at Douglas, I sort of got involved in, in a different manner than Bob had on extraterrestrials. Uh, and so I was addressing some of the things that had, I had been involved in in the Navy, uh, which were heavily involved in the Germans uh, being supported by uh, reptilian extraterrestrials uh, before World War II and during World War II. And this is a whole different story, a whole different box. Right, and we can go there in a bit. I want to go back, just try to summarize some of what you said, because I'm, I'm a little bit um, lost on uh, Dr. Harding, his work with the Egyptians. What is the communications? How does that tie into um, you know, aerospace, 
UFOs, extra, is, is it supposed to, or is this just a science? Well, I mean, re yeah, remember he's a geologist, a geophysicist, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the areas which TRW was studying, uh, Redondo Beach, was uh, the geology of the planet as being uh, maybe not the best thing that we would like to be. So both... Uh, You're talking about stability. Uh, we're talking about uh, the actual structure of the planet uh, from a astronomer standpoint. Uh, structure of the planet from a uh, structures standpoint, where both of the two areas, TRW and uh, uh, my cousin's work, uh, were studying this planet. They were studying the other planets and the moons in the solar system. They were studying uh, the distances. They were coming up with different uh, reasons for uh, strange things happening in the uh, the habit, uh, the planets around the solar system. Uh, strange things were being t uh, happening with uh, possible extraterrestrials. Uh, so uh, one of the studies at TRW was to take a look at the planet itself from say thousands of years ago. And way back, of course, they found that there was only one continent on the planet and it was on one side of the planet. So they made the assumptions that the planet was trying to fix itself because over several weeks, these single continents moved out into separate continents. The American continent, the European continent, and this sort of thing. Are you following, Bob? Yeah, I think it was several years, but that, I, that's weeks. the way Bill talks. Yeah, so weeks is years, decades, whatever. So <laughs> it's all good. Time, time has gone by. Yeah, but but the, but this effort uh, is very interesting. Well, yeah, I'm trying to tie it all into like the Egyptian communication thing. I mean, we're like you know, we're out in the stars. We're back here. It's structures. Well, if I could, if I could inject for a second, yes, one uh, of the one of the perspectives that I think the person would need to understand what Bill is saying is that that is time at TRW, which was like 68 to 71, somewhere in there, that TRW's scope of activities and involvement was, was huge. There's anything that was an unanswered question in the world is something that they would look at. Right. And so they'd set a team of people on it that w would be unique to th themselves. They wouldn't talk to other people. It would be compartmentalized. It was a classic example of compartmentalization. So they would study it down as deep as they needed to and get the answer. They would, for example, some of the kinds of questions they were trying to answer is, well, who really built the pyramids? You know? and, and of course, well, is that what Dr. Harding was doing then? Was he part of the, the TRW research into the pyramids and all these artifacts? Because we kind of went, we went from Bortz to the pyramids to structures to you know, TRW. So I'm just trying to connect the dots. and. and Understand how Dr. Well, that was just one example, yeah, but yeah. I, but I, I was trying to to say, you know, there's a yeah, dozen a dozen different subjects that TRW was studying. Right. Like, right. could you invent some other way to get engine for cars other than gasoline? You know, and and that's one of the examples of Joe Papp engine that Bill was actually in charge of that was canceled by the people from Detroit, mm -hmm. and and then how did they actually build these underground tunnels? Issues like that. Uh, 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 what was the story on uh, uh, Muslims? What, what, is, is there? I'm not quite sure what question they were trying to answer, but sure, sure. but there was a. But they had a dozen, a dozen or so studies of, of of this sort. Each one of which, at the end of it, would be something that was extremely exciting to mankind as a whole if they knew the answers. Mm -hmm. And. And, and, and literally, they had unlimited funds. This was very, very unusual. It was really the first major, major uh, think tank type of an organization that just had nothing but money to study literally every subject, like Bob is saying. Mm -hmm. 
So there was hundreds of laboratories, hundreds of sub-laboratories. And like Bob said, they were compartments. They didn't know what was going on in the other labs. Remote viewing would be a good example. Okay, there you go. Very yeah. heavy in remote viewing. Yeah. And uh, so the point was that here is this astrogeophysicist cousin of mine who then becomes an advisor to uh, the people at TRW that are studying uh, galaxies. They're studying not just stars uh, and planets, they're studying different galaxies. And then they are come to the conclusion that there's more than one galaxy. And within less than three years, they figured out when I was there that there may have been a thousand galaxies. And again, today, we now that a new number is two point trillion galaxies out there. Sure. So, but these fellows were just scratching the surface on all this front end type of programs, not even having an agenda or a requirement to come up with something. They were simply studying it, these top level people, and here my cousin would give a briefing on his thoughts of what the structure of the planet was, why it was a poor place to be, because uh, whoever it was during one of the wars a number of weeks ago between different extraterrestrials and caused one of the fifth planets to be blown up in the solar system and left all these rocks spinning around the sun, yes. which we have to You know, a lot of people out there don't even know we have an asteroid belt. They have just clueless. They have no idea we have that. So what, what Bill's referring to is that, you know, the asteroid belt that's in our solar system, um, it, we used to be a planet and gotten blasted in a, in a extraterrestrial war. Yeah. And, and, and so they're, they're addressing all of these different subjects and they're addressing the fact that uh, the continent, the American plate continent, is climbing up on top of the Pacific plate. I'm sorry, the Pacific is climbing on top of the American plate, and it's going to push it down into the magma again. It did this before, several weeks back. Mm -hmm. It even did it before uh, Noah had his flood, okay? And yes, there was more floods more recently than just the one that everybody knows about that Noah was involved in. Mm -hmm. And then we find that, gee whiz, there were four more between Noah's and us, our time-wise. So they were studying virtually everything that was going on in this TRW Space Systems secret tank facility. And uh, they had beautiful facilities there. Uh, unbelievable. My office was on the second floor of an all-glass building. Full f my opened out with a big piece of glass that went from the floor to the ceiling. To the ceiling. All futuristic uh, furniture. Uh, everything space-like. They had money. Money, and it's a fun place to work. And a fun place okay? to work, yeah. Fun place to work. Uh, but way before that, I have to get back into Bob's part uh, where, uh, for whatever reason, uh, back when I was a kid, nine years old, I uh, built some models of what I thought would be spaceships. I was very interested in that. And uh, my dad had taken us up, my brother and I, up to Mount Wilson. Uh, and we got chances to look through the telescope and talk to the astronomers. And I came up with something about, uh, which I shouldn't have said, uh, at one of those briefings, which was, uh, uh, which of the stars uh, has the planets where the people are living? And so you, you don't say that uh, in front of astronomers because astronomers did not believe that there was any other living 
organizations out in the place.